Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. So today we wanted to talk about the uh, the items we've left back in the office, I guess, the, the non-digital items. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to start off with? Yeah, well, you know, what brought this topic to mind for me was a couple of weeks ago when we were talking, you had mentioned that one of the things you missed from the office was your textbooks. And that got me thinking about items that we could transition to having digital versions of or processes that we could transition to doing digitally that we don't for whatever reason. So I thought that would be interesting to dig into. Um, I guess for me personally, um, the things that I still tend to do physically that I that I have tried virtually and, and kind of fallen back on the physical processes would be like note taking. Um, mm-hmm. I just find it more effective for myself to, to use pen and paper for that. And yeah, I still do print out a lot of things. Um, so if I'm going to, especially research, I tend to print out, um, if it's actually like a white paper or some analyst research, I'll print that out so I can mark it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those are my two big, big ones. Yeah. I'm pretty similar on the printing. You know, there's some documents, even though I get them in PDF and I could go through them uh, on on a device and and work through them, just printing them out to draw on them feels better. I don't know if there's any science behind it or not. Um, What what I have struggled with and I ended up putting a whiteboard up for was just having a whiteboard to draw on. Um, As much as I could draw on an A3 piece of paper, it's something about standing in front of a a whiteboard to to map something out that just uh, makes it flow better. Um, so those are definitely two things that I, I've I've brought with me from the office, um, and then in the same token, trying to do digital brainstorming is not the same uh, over Zoom or, or Teams. Um, I, I miss I miss those in the room discussions, um, which we've been trying to do digitally, but it's just not the same feeling. You don't get the same flow. Yeah, it's hard to quite replicate. I guess on those textbooks, I'm curious what what textbooks do you still use? You know, are they, are they ones from school or? Um, they're, they're books that I've, I've, I've accumulated over years. Um, and then the reason why they're at the office is because my wife didn't want me having them at home because they are quite, quite thick and big in some cases. So, um, if there's a, like, for example, a, a product that I'm, I'm trying to learn again, uh, was, is dynamic CRM. So there's a, there's one of those big, thick, books on that. Um, there's a book on stats um, that I reference quite a lot, um, which I've now found an electronic version that's similar. And then there's a whole bunch of business books that just uh, have had useful things in them where instead of taking a photo and maybe storing the photo of the page, I've kept the book and I've, and I've marked the thing that I find interesting for future reference. Um, so it's those things that, that uh, have, have traveled around with me and I haven't always had them in any the other offices that I've worked in, but because our offices, you know, a lot of people like to read things, uh, I've kept them there, uh, in case someone else wants to have a look at them. Um, and cause we're in the office most of the time. So it's those little things, but I've, I've managed to come right with finding them online now. And so I've ended up buying the digital versions of the books and then finding the, the spots that I remembered and marking those up uh, and now taking screenshots of those and storing them in, in notion. So I've got them there. Uh, so I've adapted. Took a while, but I've adapted. I guess, you know, that makes sense to me. I have um, a few grammar and style books that I've accumulated over the years that I, I keep at work, but don't find myself referencing all too often because if I um, get tripped up on a grammar rule or just want to remember, I usually just, you know, that's easy enough to take to the internet for unless I really want to um make sure I have the full institutional authority of some, you know, 
grammar expert behind me from a book or something like that. But, you know, my, my style requirements at work aren't, aren't quite so rigorous. I hope no one's um, critiquing <laughs> me to that degree. I guess the dynamics book is interesting to me because that seems like one that would age out pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, and it has. Um, so this one is uh, it's 2016, but it's almost uh, – so So I, what I find with, with a product like Dynamics is there's a lot of – it's about the approach that you take when you work with it. And, and what I liked about this book is that, that it, it, the way they wrote each chapter and the way they focused on the functionality was very much about why would you approach it this way. So it's less about – the actual follow this, click here, click here, click here to do this. It's more about if you want to make changes to fields, then we suggest you change them this way. Uh, if you're going to, if you're going to, the way that Dynamics works is you can have a sort of core solution, which is the product, and then you can deploy your own customizations in your own solution on top of that. So if you're going to remove key functionality because you don't want it in your solution, you can do that in your own solution without impacting the core product. Um, so it's it's really the why would you do things that I keep the book for. Uh, and sometimes it's just quicker to go and shoot through the index and look for something than it is to go Google and sift through 10,000 examples of someone trying to do it, which is not quite how you would have done it or not quite related to how you or what you're looking for. Uh, where the book tends, you know, in most cases has has had something useful, at least, at least made my question to Google a lot clearer because I'm calling the component by the right name as opposed to what I think it is. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a good reference book in that sense. Google can be kind of tricky with, with some of those product searches in particular, or, um, you know, when you, when you're looking for something very specific, because I feel like so much of the, so much of Google has been taken over by, you know, marketing folks like me who are trying to target keywords to, you know, get them mm. to appear or, you know, content creators in general. So it can, it can you know, confuse the uh, the search there. Yeah, and, that, and that's exactly the challenge is you end up spending hours, I won't say hours, but you spend a good hour sifting through search terms and, and multiple mm -hmm. pages trying to find that thing. Whereas having the book, and, and this is sort of why I still buy books as opposed to saying everything's on the internet, I can just find it there. If someone sp spent the time packaging it in the right structure or in a structure, that, that helps to convey how to, how to do something. Um, so when you go looking in the book, there'll be a bit of a story potentially, you know, depending on the book you're buying, obviously a fiction will be different, but a, but a nonfiction education book will have a structure and approach. So it's very easy usually to find the solution to what you're looking for in, and then potentially an example. Now that example may not be the, uh, you know, best practice industry, most secured example, but at least get you going to say, okay, I now know where to start and I can kind of get for, with a bit of hacking or whatever it is to where I want to be um, without wasting too much time trying to find the right video on YouTube. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, I came into the technology industry as somewhat of a self-professed self -professed Luddite. I mean, I'm not really, but... Um, definitely not like technology first for just solving things in my own life. You know, I like books. I like physical books. I like the tactile, mm. um, you know, nature of them. If I'm doing creative writing, that's almost always pen and paper over typing. It just, my brain works differently that way. And I think that's why I still like to take notes physically as well. There's sometimes, you know, if I want to draw a diagram or a table or something in my notes, it's a lot easier to, to do that than to, um, you know, do it within a program sometimes for me, depending on, you know, the complexity of what I'm creating, I guess. And I can totally agree with that because I, uh, I mean, I've tried to get away from writing notes so many times um, and, and using, getting rid of, you know, having too many moleskins and too many, uh, you know, sort of A5 booklets, A4 booklets, whatever it is. Uh, I end up coming back to them often, even though I, I do shift to them. So what I, I kind of do now is I have a lot of post notes that I'll make notes on, very quick notes. So if I'm in a call and I need to make notes, I'll, I'll make them on there. But then I have a cleanup process in my head at the end of the day where I'll convert those into notes in uh, in drafts in on my iPad. 
which then means that note sits with me in, in sort of a stage two cleanup. And then I have a stage three cleanup, which will either put it into some sort of action I have to do, uh, or it goes into Notion as as reference material for whatever it is. And that's how I've done it. Just because I, I, same as you, I find the tactile writing is is more more beneficial than just putting it straight into a task manager or straight into a notes thing on my on on an app because it almost goes out of my head. But the tactile writing keeps it there for a bit longer. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm looking at my my notebook, um, you know, in terms of like things I go to the office supply closet for. It's it's generally that. And I only have a few mm. pages left since we've been, you know, quarantining for a few months now. Um, I'm going to have to find some scrap paper lying around the house. And I did. I think it's interesting that you brought up Notion because I did want to talk about, you know, some of the technologies that we do incorporate or have have tried to incorporate so mm-hmm. is is notion something you've been using for a long time um i don't know how long we probably, probably probably been using it most of lockdown so it's a fairly new app um so previously i had tried evernote i tried OneNote, i tried apple notes um previous version of apple notes now there's a new version which or a more updated version which i'm now using again um and I found Evernote to be very slow and painful to use, but they did have one thing that I really liked, which which one which OneNote didn't have, which was the ability to tag things, so you could find them in searches and that. The the challenge that I have with Evernote is, in order to use it though, you ended up having to pay quite a lot for what you for, in my opinion, what you were getting out of it, um, and also it wasn't a, wasn't that fast. So if you wanted to write something really quickly, you would almost lose what you had in your mind because Evernote would take so long to open. Uh, and that didn't matter which device it was on, whether it was on an iPhone, iPad, laptop, whatever, web. It was just it was just clunky and slow. Um, so I tried OneNote. I moved everything across, but that was that was even worse. Um, it lacked that structure that I got out of Evernote. So I ended up going back to uh, to as I said, paper, books, and stuff. And I would still just dump things into Evernote, but I almost forgot about it once I got to Evernote. And then someone that I knew mentioned Notion. And he gave me a whole bunch of videos to watch on YouTube, which I ended up watching and going, okay, well, I'll try this thing out. Um, and it's been quite quite good. Uh, it's very much a wiki style of, of capturing things. So you, as much as you could, you can import your stuff from Evernote, which, I, which I've done. Oh, I've missed one thing. I'll come back to that. Um, so what, what I like about it is you, can, you create pages, and those pages can interlink between other pages. And that was one of my challenges with, with Evernote is if, is if I had a, a – a note that I wanted to link to another note, I couldn't really do that. And I had to sort of move them into different books and I found that very uh, clinic, uh, clunky. Um, the other tool that I was using was a thing called Quip, uh, Q-U-I-P, which was bought by Salesforce. And I quite liked that because it was quick to to open up and write. The problem there was was that it, it wasn't um, wasn't really great for, for workflow-y stuff. Um, so having things sort together and and um, as I say, have this interconnectedness. So when I got onto Notion, I basically moved everything from both applications into into Notion, and I quite enjoyed it. It, it works on on all the devices, which is important because I, I, I you know have a Windows device and a and a Apple device um, or Apple devices. So I wanted something that was multi device. Um, it is also a bit clunky. You got to kind of get used to it, but it's very flexible. You can do pretty much you know, anything you want from task management to reference material to building little apps and a lot of sort of API things you can do with it. You can write scripts. So it's quite powerful. So I quite like it. I'm still getting used to it. Um, and I've shared some stuff with you, which is also quite nice. So I, I, as, as the, the subscriber, I can share it with anybody else, um, which I quite like. So it's, it's a good tool from that point of view, from collaboration and stuff. Um, I still use Apple Notes. Um, and I use Apple Notes primarily if I'm in a meeting and I want to take notes and I've left my post-its behind, I'll write the notes in Apple Notes and then I will transfer them as a PDF into into Notion. Um, so be, it's becoming my brain, in a sense, Notion, which I could never get right with Evernote or with um, Quip. So, yeah. I'd lo- yeah. I'd love to check in in a few more months and see if Notion is still – you know, if you still feel the same way about it um, and see if that's like, because I'm wondering, you know, 
if if over time you'll find some you know flaw in it that uh, isn't working for you or if um or if it is like the the right tool for you there yeah no it would be interesting because because I, I find it if i listen to other people and they're sort of journeys they they also tend to change every six months my my biggest frustration with changing is you you get so far down the road of moving stuff in into a solution that to move it out again is almost more painful than just just dealing with the um the frustration that the tool doesn't give you what, what i have found which which is a, a plus on notion versus the other vendors um is when i've sent them a support request about anything uh like how do i do this like i'm struggling or you know, could you do this? I've gotten a response fairly quickly and either we can't do this, here's, here's some other options or, oh, that's a really a good idea. We'll put that on the roadmap, which I think also translates into a personal, I don't want to say ownership, but, but, uh, because they're willing to listen to me, I feel like, you know, there's a, there's a potential here for a long-term relationship. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. Interesting times. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting that it's notion that you've kind of turned to because that's one that I've been getting more podcast ads for. So it seems <laughs> like it's perhaps an up and coming app. We're definitely not sponsored on this podcast um, as much as we'd probably love to be. So yeah, no, that'd be good. Well, so, so you don't use any electronic or digital um, note taking or, or, or task tracking or anything like that? So I've tried so many, it feels like you know, OneNote, um, just notes in my OneDrive. Um, I've used Asana, I've used Trello, you know, I've used Slack and Teams, and these kind of all fulfill little different pieces of function, whether it's, you know, collaborating with my team. Um, I've tried some of the Microsoft project management apps, like um, I think it's Planner, Mm. And, um, to do, which to do appealed to me because it's like a simple list. Um, you know, I guess along with note taking, just making a to-do list is something that I still fall back on doing physically. I guess for me, what happens is if I make it, if I make it digital, I no longer, you know, and then I close my tab or whatever, I don't see it anymore. And for Mm. me, like just the, sometimes I just need the constant reminder. It's like, um, you know, I like crossing things off my, my physical to-do list. And if it's not staring me in the face and there's this like small thing that I wanted to remember to to do today, if that's in a digital spot, I might miss it. Yeah. So, so that's why I used you, which is that, that app I mentioned to you the other day, because if you put something on there, it reminds you and, mm-hmm. and, and it reminds you until you basically dismiss it or you um, postpone it or you do mark it done. And it just, Sometimes it can be painful because you you got like seventeen things come up at the same time because you postponed them, but sometimes it's also good because you're like, oh, I completely forgot that I needed to put the bins out, or I had to, to do this with the weekly report or something. Because um, you you can future future schedule things to to occur. Um, I found all the ones you mentioned, so I've used all of them as well. And the biggest challenge that I found is trying to mix in your personal stuff with your work stuff and trying to get them to link together. Um, and that's between not only your tasks, but also your calendars. And I haven't found a solution for that yet. Someone's probably listening out there, you know, getting an <laughs> idea for a killer app. Um, <laughs> well, I think, you know, that's a great way to transition into our automation topic, which we also wanted to discuss today. So I'd mm. love to hear about how your personal automation journey has been the past uh, two weeks. Yeah, so I, I took um, the thing that I wanted to automate and, and I've got it kind of working how I wanted it to be. So so when I sit down to work on something that requires concentration, um, so normally it's writing something or generating some content for something, I, I follow the Pomodoro method to an extent where I book out 25 minutes and then I have a, a, a five or 10 minute timer and then I want to do another 25 minutes. So, so in essence, you're getting an hour of concentration with with some breaks built in. So what I what I typically would do is, and it depends on what time of the morning. If it's really early, I don't use my little alarm clock. I use my watch to, to do the timer because um, I don't want to wake anybody if it's early. Um, if it's during the day, then I then I use the little timer thing. And I've got this this clock that you can turn to. It's, it only measures sixty minutes, uh, and you just turn it to when you want to start, and then it'll count down and then beep when it hits the the end of the time. So what I managed to set up. Um, is with an NFC tag, 
So I ordered those on Amazon when we were after our conversation. Um, when I when I put my phone on that tag, it starts the timers. So the first time it starts is the, is the first 25 minute timer. It then has a delay and then it starts the second timer for 10 minutes. And then it has, and the delay is the first 25 minutes. And then the third time is another 25 minutes. And that basically logs uh, at the end of it in, in a drafts page that I did this, this session. Um, the piece that I want to add to it is that it actually captures an, in an input box what I was working on at that time. So I can almost have this, this long list of what have you worked on by date. Uh, that's that's the plan. But that saves me now instead of me having to set the timers and all the rest of it as I'm working, which is, you know, it's probably costing me 30 seconds at a time. But it's now a tap and it, and, and that's, that's really cool because that saves me one and a half minutes each time I do it, which it sounds small. But it's also the first time I've written my own short. Well, I say written my own shortcut. The first time I've created my own shortcut that's actually a productivity gain. Um, and 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 exploring the NFC tags has been quite interesting. Which um, you can you can save stuff onto the NFC tags. So what I'm thinking of for my next automation is to turn is to put an NFC tag on the back of my phone, which would be my business card information. So you know my phone number, my email address, my whatever. And when I meet someone when we're allowed to meet people, uh, I'll have them tap on that NFC tag and they'll get all my details. Because um, that's also, so I, you know, I always forget to carry business cards with me. Uh, and I think the tag will be fun because that'll be just on the back of the phone. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like it fits your role really well to have something like that. So um, that's a really cool way to do it. Do you feel like that has just workflow wise, you know, not taking that 30 seconds and just hitting the button instead, has that improved kind of the, the flow state and even strengthened that method? Have you noticed a difference? It, it has in the sense that it's, it's one less thing to remember to do. So now all I have to do is, I would say it's probably a few things less to do. Now it's just tap and go. Whereas before it was, oh, I'm gonna set my timer. Okay, set the time for 25 minutes, and then I'll start working. And then when the when the buzzer goes off, I go, oh, I must remember now to set this to 10 minutes, um, and then it go, and then I must remember to set it back to 25 minutes. So those are those are three or four extra steps each time, which are just unnecessary steps. So now what happens is I as I just tap my phone on the on this thing, uh, put the phone down, and I start working. Uh, and when the timer goes off. I just do whatever I do in my break, which might be go grab some coffee, might do some push-ups, whatever it is. Um, and when the timer goes off again, uh, I know to get back to my desk and start. And I don't mind if I lose a minute because I've, I'm sitting down again, but the point is I'm not worrying about measuring out that whole hour. Um, and then the capturing at the end of that would go automatically straight into to drafts. The only thing that, that kind of, you know, where it gets a little bit complicated is, is what happens if you get interrupted in those minutes and you lose that second session or you lose that first session, then you, then you have to go kill the kid. You have to go manually kill the timers. Um, but that's, you know, it's it's a simple automation in a, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so it, it saves me saves me some extra thought processing. Yeah, I mean, it sounds, it sounds cool. I'll have to try out seriously the Pomodoro method sometime. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I, I know some people uh, do longer sessions, but I found 25 minutes to be quite nice. So it's long enough that you can get into a flow with something short enough also that you don't feel like you're burning out. Like some guys go 45 minutes. I think 45 minutes is a bit long. Yeah. I think for me, it would vary a lot on the task at hand. Yeah, what well, it does, it does. And yourself, did you try any, any personal automation things? Yeah. So my challenge is really just to wear my, my Apple watch, right? And Mm -hmm. uh, kind of see what that experience is like since I have kind of been it um just I, I set it aside for quarantine thinking you know I'm definitely not going to be moving as much I don't really want my watch to scream at me for that um but I did you know I've been wearing it so I have some thoughts um the first one is that after not wearing it for so long uh, my move ring went down significantly like I think it was only asking me to move so to make up for like a hundred calories, it, it wanted me to like move my goal down to that, which I thought was interesting um, because it was just based on not, it was based on the inactivity of not wearing the watch, not on, you know, data collected about my movement, um, which is kind of 
you know, of course it's, you can choose not to set it to that level, but I thought that's kind of, um, you know, it's slightly annoying in that, like, if I'm not wearing my watch and I put it on again, I, you know, it's not that I haven't been moving a similar amount as I always have. It's just, I wasn't wearing the watch. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of like the stand goal, that's very, I feel like I, I found that easier to hit at home than in the office. I think part of it is like, I've been working on a wooden dust chair, um, that (laughs) was like, I have been dragging around with me for, I guess since childhood, you know, it was passed down to me for my dad. So it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, so I think that it definitely encourages me to get up and stretch more. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, and, and I think, it's, it's been interesting wearing again. I think what I need to do is try a, new, a few more weeks and actually maybe listen to all of the prompts it, it sends me. Um, because right now what I'm mostly getting out of it is notifications, which are a lot of um, New York Times alerts because I have like news alerts synced up to send me on my watch, um, which is nice to stay informed. But with everything going on right now, I don't necessarily want to see the news roll in as it happens, I'll save that for the end of the day when I can, you know, not be so distracted. Yeah, I must admit that sort of stuff I turn off. Um, I find that very frustrating. Uh, in fact, it causes anxiety for me to be no- constantly notified about news and and that sort of thing. So what I, yeah. I only have on as notifications go um, is due and probably – other exercise so if someone like because i've joined my watch with in fact we should we should link up um if any of my friends have done their exercise for the day i get their notification come through which i quite like from a motivation point of view because it means i must go out and do something uh if i haven't done it already yeah i haven't tried any of that you know that sharing with friends so that would be interesting yeah that's good I'll, i'll send you mine i'll send you a link after this so we can join them up um, I find it just keeps you, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm not excessive on the exercise, you know, do 30 minutes, maybe an hour a day, but it just keeps you going, which is, which is important because I think exercise is important. Uh, yeah. I think, I think, um, having like fitness buddies is definitely always an effective way to go. Mm. No, cool. And, and are you tracking your sleep at all or, or you just leave it on during the day? I just leave it on during the day. Um, uh, I guess I don't know how charging would work for me if I slept with it. Yeah, you've got to, you've almost got to, so like now, because I'm sitting at my desk for, for a good period of time, you know, it's on the charger. Um, and if I go and have a shower, it goes in the charger. So you're constantly charging it as opposed to one long charge. Um, I used to have two watches, but I found actually managing two watches more painful than it was worth. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've heard of people doing that. I guess, you know, that's still one of the downsides with the Apple Watch versus mm. like the Garmin's is the battery life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and my wife's quite sensitive to to light. So when she sleeps, I've got to, got to have the watch off anyway. So I've actually moved away from Apple Watch for, for tracking sleep. Um, and I use a, an Aura Ring, which is a lot more interesting if you like the data but that's probably a topic for another day. <laughs> yeah, I know we're short on time. So um, do you have to go? I do, I do. Okay. But it's been good, good, good catching up. Yeah, this is a fun conversation. Cool, speak soon. All right, have a good rest of your day, Ryan. You too, cheers, eh? bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.